Joseph C. Jaconda is an author who's with us here just now. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Now, you've got a book which is due out this October called Salem's Ropes. So how would you describe that book, first of all? Sure. So uh, Salem's Ropes is a, I would describe it as a paranormal psychological thriller. Mm. Um, It's got elements of the paranormal in it. It is uh, based on a true story, uh, the true story of a mansion in Salem, Massachusetts, that has had quite an interesting and storied past since it was uh, first built in 1720. Oh, and is that kind of spooky stuff that may or may not be true? or is it all believable stuff? Uh, Well, some of it is uh, documented historically that there were a lot of strange and suspicious deaths in the house, uh, murders. um, There were some strange, bizarre um, tragedies that occurred in the house. One of the owners of the house caught fire. Her her dress burst into flames and she died. That's all well documented. Um, It was vacant for a number of years despite its beautiful real estate location in downtown Salem. Them. Nobody wanted to live in it for a number of years. And for the last hundred years or so, it's been a museum that is reportedly haunted. Yeah, I can imagine nobody would want to live in it. it. Takes one Google search to find out what's wrong with it. That's right. Yeah. So do you believe in this spooky stuff yourself necessarily? It's funny. I I was very skeptical mm. for a very long time. Um, I always thought there might be something to it. And I had a personal experience not too long ago that convinced me that there is absolutely something um, on the other side or that we cannot see necessarily with our eyes, but we can sense and detect. And uh, that personal experience made it very real for me. And I was, uh, I've now convinced there is something now, whether or not we understand it is another story, but um, I do think there is something very real and very, um, strange out there in the world yeah definitely and i don't really know how personal the experience was but would you mind sharing it well it it is personal i would say this um Mm. i was invited to um witness a paranormal investigation Mm. uh by a group it was private it was just me and the group and i uh saw things and perceived things and heard things that are inexplicable. And then subsequent to that experience, some very terrible things happened Mm -hmm. uh, that I believe could not be explained in any other way, except related to that experience. Um, And so I think there, there are things out there that we shouldn't meddle with. Um, And so, yeah, I, 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 it confirmed in me that there is something to this. Yeah. And most people, probably believe that ghosts aren't necessarily real but when you look at studies or surveys or whatever the rates of people that have experienced something unexplainable seems to be surprisingly high i agree um and i would also note that my so i had my personal background i had once studied to be a catholic priest long ago and i spent four years in the seminary before i left and joined secular life and have a family now and i practice law as my day job in addition to writing. And um, if you think about it, religion is, if you're religious or spiritual, you really automatically believe that there is an unseen world. Mm. Uh, We all have different views philosophically about what that is. But if you believe in God and angels, then by definition, you believe in demons and the devil of some sort. Um, And I think scientifically speaking, I think that scientists who are open-minded would admit that quantum physics opens up you know the what, what was previously improbable or impossible to very very po- very possible given alternate dimensions um yeah. time travel you know things like that <laughs> wormholes quantum physics things that heretofore were completely uh, inscrutable are now more and more mainstream in modern physics yeah definitely and i guess science changes all the times so we're constantly discovering new things so who knows what we could find in the that's next right. few years that's right that's right Right, exactly. Who knows? Yeah. So for your book, Salem's Ropes, how long mm-hmm. did it take you to write it? So it's funny. It, it, it So Salem's Ropes was a departure. My first book that I wrote, The Pope's Butcher, mm-hmm. was a, a base, historical fiction based on a true story of a serial killer in the medieval Vatican. That took me many, many years to research and write.
site. Uh, and I finally published that. And uh, that, that was more in the historical fiction vein. What happened with Salem's Ropes is sort of fascinating. I had finished up Pope's Butcher and was starting to think about my second book. And I had a dream. And I don't remember my dreams very often. Um, and when I woke up, Salem's Ropes, the entire story was completely formulated in my head. Wow. And I could envision the house where it occurred. Yet I had never been to that house. Hmm. And I thought that was very odd. So about, so I wrote it down in a lengthy email, sent it to my brothers so that there was a, a witness to it. <laughs> I sent it to them. So it was in my outbox. And then uh, about six months later, I traveled up to Boston and I took a drive to Salem. And I was absolutely mystified by the fact that a lot of the images I had seen in my dream were very real places, wow. places I had never been or seen before, like um, Dead Horse Beach and uh, Juniper Point. These are places that I had visually seen in my dream, but never been to or even seen on the uh, internet or anything like that. So when I came back from that trip, I sat down and I, I cranked out that book in not a very long time at all, probably two months, uh, it was finished. And so compared to The Pope's Butcher, which took years, Salem's Ropes was fully formed in my head. The storyline um, was already formed unconsciously, I suppose. Hmm. So it was an interesting process. Yeah, it's so weird. I guess that's a spiritual really experience in itself, maybe. Yeah, I, it was really more like, I think, an amalgam of ideas, stories, and things that popped into my head um, yeah. just all simultaneously. But like I said, I don't dream very often. It was a certainly <laughs> fruitful dream. I hope I have more <laughs> like that where it gives me good ideas for books. <laughs> Yeah. But um, it was definitely a one-of-a-kind experience. Yeah. And was the finished story exactly the same as the dream, or did you have to adapt it a bit? Because most dreams make no sense. No, great question. No, I definitely did have to adapt it. I, I think yeah. the concept of the storyline of what happened in the mansion and how it uh, played out with the fictional characters uh, in, in my head, that that arc was there, but it needed a ton more flushing out in terms of you know additional characters and um, an explanation for things. So mm -hmm. uh, four or five key plot points were in my dream and my in my unconscious, but um, the rest yeah. of it is you know the byproduct of the typical writing process. Yeah, and they say, don't they, that dreams only last like a few seconds or something, but they yeah. feel much longer. So yeah. you've got a whole book out of a few seconds of your life, which is That's impressive. Probably right. Yeah, <laughs> probably right. Like I said, I hope it happens again, but I can uh, <laughs> be inspired in that way it reminds me of a few there are a few artists um out there musicians and so forth who woke up with entire songs and sometimes albums uh, in their head from a dream and they jotted them down and oh, yeah. i believe the unconscious taps into um something that mm -hmm. can uh, allow us to be inspired by the muse that consciously may never happen if we really tried you know hard to think about it yeah i guess that's true the inspiration just comes when you're not thinking about it and yeah. you're in a state of not caring maybe yeah that's what people say some of the mm. best uh inventions have come to people in the middle of the night and uh, yeah. great uh, scientists have had some inspiration so it was a really kind of remarkable experience now now that being said you know it's not it's not that uh, it, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say the insights were were that uh, great it was more that the storyline yeah. gelled in a way in my dream that made it sense to write down yeah have you had any similar dreams in the past that weren't quite good enough to write a book about? Never. Never before or since. It was the only experience I ever had where the story itself was worth writing down. Now, I've had dreams before, but they were usually just kind of quick yeah. thoughts. For some reason, I woke up that morning and had this, this story in my head that just kind of flowed into yeah. a, a book. Yeah. Just be careful, because imagine if it turned out that you'd went to sleep with the telly on and you'd stolen it from a movie. <laughs> That's certainly Certainly, certainly a good point. Certainly a good point. <laughs> yeah. Well, how did you first go from being a lawyer to writing horror novels? Yeah, it's a great question. So when, uh, so my day job is as a lawyer, and I do a lot of writing, but it's very technical writing, very boring, uh, legal writing contracts and legal briefs and so forth. And so I've always had a creative side that didn't really have an outlet. And I am a big fan of horror uh, movies and books, always have been ever since I was a kid. I, I always love uh, movies and horror books, Stephen King and so forth. And so um, the Pope's Butcher started really more of an amalgam of my interest in horror, but also in history 
and historical fiction. And so I spent a ton of time doing real research the way you would as a lawyer, looking at documents. And, you know, I actually traveled to all the places in Europe where it was set and took detailed notes. And I actually really enjoyed that process. Um, But with uh, more recent horror that I've written, it's been really more a function of breaking out of the mold of writing like a lawyer and trying Mm -hmm. to write more like, you know, entertainment, completely different process in a way, because, Mm -hmm. of course, reading a legal document is not the purpose is not to be entertained. The purpose is uh, to be informed and writing horror, it's to be entertained. And if information comes along the way, that's great. But it's just a completely different part of the brain, I suppose. But uh, I I very much enjoy the process. Yeah. And I guess a lot of the time when you're being a lawyer, you have to see things from different perspectives, which I guess can help a bit with creativity. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I I think the 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 part of writing that um, was not um, formed as a lawyer was really the visualization of a scene and of Mm. communicating through dialogue, you know. Ideas certainly are communicated by lawyers to to judges and juries and so forth. But yeah. setting the scene and the um, the the tension and the expectation that's something you really get. Um, really, anyone can get from watching movies or writing down ideas. Um, my suggestion to people who are interested in exploring writing, uh, you know, may, they may have ideas, uh, little ideas here and there, is to start with short stories. And I have a third book that just came out called Fleeting Chills. That's a, an anthology of short stories, some of which I wrote and some of which are from authors from around the world. And they can be very short, you know, 1,500 words, 2,000 words. And you can explore those fleeting ideas that don't necessarily warrant an entire book. Um, but writers can still learn how to capture that idea and put it into a, a short little story. Yeah. And horror and law might not necessarily go together because in law, <laughs> I don't really think there's an excuse for the devil made me do it kind of thing. <laughs> and so law doesn't really see ghost and spirituality as a fact. So I right. guess it's interesting that you studied that and wrote about it. Yeah, I, I really think that that interest came more from me from studying to be a priest rather than a lawyer. You're right. The law is very much built on facts. But of course, being a lawyer is also about communicating ideas and inferences. And much of horror is not in what you tell, but as much as what you don't tell and the reader infers. Mm. So how actually did your early background studying to become a Catholic priest contribute to your interest in horror then? So I think it was going back to the concept of the unseen and Mm. so much of what you study in spirituality and religion is about that. And um, and I was just fascinated that priests study theology and, and basically study the concepts of the unseen and how they interact with the emotion world of people, right? Of the faithful. We, we, we express ourselves in confession or, you know, mass or um, spiritual services, and it's all about the unseen. And so I think for me, that was in some senses more um, influential on my thinking and writing than being a lawyer. Yeah, definitely. So how would you say your writing process is? What's it like? Because do you wake up really early in the morning and get all your words down? Or are you more a night owl? Yeah, so most of my writing happens when I can fit it in. It's not something that I write at a rigid time, like some of the writing occurs after work, or it can occur um, even during work, during a lunch break. But yeah, most of my writing occurs late at night. Um, There are some people who are, you know, early, early birds um, and get their time in before that. I'm more of a late out, late night owl. So yeah. if I can get, you know, if the kids are asleep and, and, and work is done, if I can get into a writing mode at midnight or something like that and squeeze in an hour or two, I find for me, that's the most fruitful time. And it also mm-hmm. for, for horror and for that kind of work, <laughs> writing in the dark makes more sense than writing <laughs> in the daylight. <laughs> yeah. It gets you in the mood. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And how's COVID been? Because I'm guessing you'd probably 
probably be classed as a key worker as a lawyer. So your schedule would have perhaps been the same. Yeah. So being a lawyer, most of uh, during during COVID, I you know in quarantine, I worked uh, from home, but I was also able to work in a, an office I have here where there weren't too many other people. And actually, uh, that's when I decided it was during COVID that I decided to finish the Pope's Butcher because it had been on the shelf for a while. I hadn't wrapped it up. Yeah. I'd done so much research and I had written a draft, but it really needed a lot more uh, editing and perfection to get it to get it published. And uh, so, yeah, early in COVID, I decided to use some of that pent up energy of sitting inside and uh, and when I when I wanted a break from working on my regular legal work. And so that's that's the impetus, actually, of when I got started in um, publishing fiction. Yeah. And I guess you wouldn't really have been able to travel internationally to places to get inspiration like you did before. That's right. That's right. All of the pictures, videos, notes and everything that I had previously um, were something I drew on. And then during that you know, 18 months or however long that we were really limited in travel, um, I really was able to draw on that material. And in some ways, I think people found, I can't speak for everyone, but I think some people found it in some ways an opportunity um, because you were confined and you really had an opportunity to really focus on what you had learned in your travels without an, um, a, a distraction of more travels. Like you could say, <laughs> okay, let me take stock in the books I've read and the trap trips I've made and the things I've learned and, you know, turn it into something creative. So for me, it was an outlet. Yeah, I guess we don't often realize that we've already been to the places that could give us the inspiration. But right. because you didn't go there originally with a book in mind, it probably is a bit harder mm -hmm. yeah i had a lot of uh, pictures videos and notes and books about the places i'd been and so as i wrote i dug those out and mm -hmm. of course the internet has made it infinitely easier to virtually visit or revisit places yeah. you've been to find out more information but in the post butcher i was able to draw on all of those things now what happened with salem was funny because i, I had had the dream but i didn't actually visit it until i had um started to write the book after the fact, which is interesting. Yeah, definitely. So what's coming up in the not too distant future for you? Any more books? I do have a fourth uh, book coming out. Uh, it's half written. Um, it's not complete yet. I, I have most of the draft done, but I really want to work on it some more and actually travel to New Orleans because I've been in New Orleans a number of times, but it is about a true story based on a true story of a serial killer that um, was in New Orleans a uh, hundred years ago. And um, there are some chilling and strange echoes of the historical serial killers in modern murders that occurred after Hurricane Katrina. So it's uh, it's an interesting uh, story, I hope. Um, that should come out by February 2021. 20, uh, and then I have a fifth book idea Two. that I'm working on, but I haven't put pen to paper yet. Yeah. Just want to check you mean 2022 before 2022. We all get confused. That's right. That's right. 2022. <laughs> Easy to forget that's around the corner. Yeah. February 2022 is when uh, it's called Katrina's Crosses. So keep yeah. an eye out for that. But it still feels like 2019 to be honest doesn't it <laughs> feels like we've been in, in a twilight zone for a couple of years so yes 2022 right around the corner yeah and when you're not writing books and being a lawyer what kind of stuff do you get up to in your free time if you have any left yeah i don't have too much to be frank um yeah. i i uh my favorite thing to do these days when i take a mental break from everything is i have a convertible that i bought mm -hmm. during covid an old car that's a convertible and i just love taking that around and taking it to the into the country um sometimes i'll go hiking um fishing uh things like that out in nature and i find that is the best way to unplug and um sort of remove the grip of modern technology is to yeah. go out and uh, take a take a hike or a bike ride you know for a few miles up into the nature and i find to me that's one of my most fun things to do yeah definitely well where are we able to check out your books if we'd like to read them uh, the best place to get everything these days is probably amazon um of course you know they're available in independent bookstores and barnes and noble as well but i, I recommend amazon because we have uh kindle uh, books available in kindle unlimited we also offer on amazon um from time to time countdown deals and uh free free ebooks and we're also um publishing the uh, pope's butcher as well as fleeting chills 
uh, on an audio book, which will be coming out next month. And there's also a Spanish translation of the Pope's Butcher coming out next month as well. And Amazon, we've just found to be a good central hub for everyone around the world to uh, find the book, both in ebook and paperback. Yeah, definitely. That seems to be the best place that everyone mentions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks right. very much for coming on the show. It's been great having you here. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope everybody enjoys the, the interview. And, and look, I look forward to getting feedback on the books as well. I always love reading reviews.